Hey, everybody. I am Brooke Ishibashi. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm in New York City right now. I'm native of Southern California, and I'm so, so happy to be here with Matthew and with Mark. And I am an actor, I'm a singer, and I'm a labor leader and arts advocate. And I'm very excited to get into all the dirt with all y'all today. Matt, take it away. Uh, my name is Matthew Lear Erlbach. I am a playwright, TV writer, uh, also actor and uh, labor activist. I'm from Chicago and New York, and uh, I'm also a Capricorn, and I'm very happy to be here. And I'm a co-founder of Be An Arts Hero and uh, also known as Arts Workers United. I would love to get started with how many actors do, do we know who, in introducing themselves, also say labor activist? I would say now more than before. I think there's mm -hmm. been uh, an awakening in our industry. Uh, and when I say industry, I'm just going to kind of the performing arts. There's been an, a labor awakening. It's happening all over the country. Um, this is a huge moment for labor. And that's not surprising. Um, history repeats itself. Uh, we're in the midst of another, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. And this is what happened at the turn of the 20th century too. But I think more actors identify as labor, uh, labor awakened than before. Brooke, do you think that's, um, did COVID had anything to do with that? Absolutely, Mark. I think, if you were to ask us that question two years ago, our answer would have been very different. Matt, I'm not sure if you'd agree with me. He's nodding his head, yes. Um, I do think that the, one of the beautiful things about the work that we started to do together in summer of 2020 is that we found like-minded artist advocates and activists who were all awakened, but also compelled to do this work, but it came out of necessity. And that necessity was, you know, that, that was a response to, to, to the pandemic and the domino effect it had, you know, on our industries, on uh, 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 our neighbor industries, our sister and brother industries, et cetera. So I do think that COVID had everything to do with it because it, it came up this, the, the, the need to become an artist activist advocate, it came out of des a desperate, um, a desperate response to the consequences of the pandemic and how it affected all of our industries. In talking to you folks earlier and, and reading some of the material that you've sent, there is, um, I think there's that in front of the camera, we, we think of actors and then maybe behind the camera, we just think of directors and, and, and the people that we maybe we see on the Oscars or the Golden Globes. But there is a, that's the very tippy top of a very, very large pyramid. And if someone were to stay at and watch the credits of a movie you would see that there was like there was a thousand people on the set of or on the crew of avatar for instance it, uh, is that the group of people we're talking about i mean i know it's motion pictures and it's broadway and it's plays and it's community theater and it's all of it right yeah, yeah. we speak about well, matt you want to go first go for it well, we, we can tag team it. Uh, we speak about it as the creative economy and that's publishing libraries, broadcasting. It isn't just Hollywood, it isn't just Broadway, it isn't just music, it isn't just the performing arts. It's so many other industries that fall under the banner of the creative economy. We're a $919 billion uh, work, workforce, you know, and that's how much we contribute to the U.S. economy, and that's 5.2 million arts workers. So, as we'll go into later, you know, we define who we are and what we do as arts work. We're arts workers because it's a labor movement. And um, so, yes, when we when when we do speak about uh, the the arts and culture sector, we're talking about the entire creative economy, and that's so much more than just the performing arts, which is largely, as you said, what people tend to. Uh, tap uh, uh, zero in on as they think about the people who are in front of the camera. Matt, did you want to hop in? Yeah, you know, I love the credits because what other industry can you wait at the end of a product and see all the employees hired to make that product? Avatar is a business. Any TV show is a business. And if you're lucky, the product runs for 10 seasons. And if it's network, maybe you have 25 episodes. So you're employed you know, 250 times, 25 episodes times 10 seasons, let's say, 250 times your name is showing up in the list of employees that made that. I don't have that on a bottle of water. I don't have that in other material. And so 
when we look at the creative worker movement and what this awakening is, to go back to your earlier question too, out of necessity and this desperation that Brooke mentioned, you know, this was the breaking point. This stuff didn't just come out of nowhere. It was a revelation. It was an unveiling. It was an unmasking. These issues, these, you know, systemic issues of, of, of uh, inclusion and diversity and equity and economic justice and um, labor hours were all there. And it took the pandemic to go ah, record scratch. Right. We have a pause now and we can finally look at this. I don't think the work that we've been doing evangelizing about the creative economy and the creative worker movement would have had as much gas had people not been forced to confront the issues that had been systemic for so long. I think that uh, to that point exactly, every industry, every industry, the, the cracks were just widened from education. Mm -hmm. I mean, every, I wouldn't, you don't even have to say one because mm -hmm. everything was affected. What's interesting though, is that the two of you, and, and I know there's other people involved in the organization and it was a whole, it takes a village and all of that, but you actually escalated this to the legislature. Is that correct? Oh yeah. Tell yeah. us about that. Um, well, um, what let's, how do I, how do I make the, where do we start, Matt? Here, I'll, I'll do the, I'll do the like shortest version of all. I was working on an open letter to the U.S. Senate, Brooke, Carson Elrod, and uh, Jenny Grace Macomb had been taking this incredible data, um, and they had been doing social media work and building this network. We joined forces and created this Captain Planet moment of putting all our skill sets together. The letter ended up complementing all of this work that had been happening on social media. Um, you know, Billy Porter was on the Today Show talking about these numbers, et cetera. The letter got around 25,000 signatures from everyone you would want, and then some. That letter was for the Senate, was talking about our net worth, saying we need to extend FPUC, saying we need legislation. Mm -hmm. We took that, started knocking on the doors of the House and the Senate. Everyone and anyone met with, um, uh, I think it was like around 70 Senate offices and countless House offices, cold calling, cold emailing, creating relationships with legislative aides, correspondence, chiefs of staff, specialists in the office. One thing led to another. Uh, somehow I got the bright idea to write a bill, which was nuts. We started. It was, that was from Kamala Harris. Office. You're the so, you're the writer in the family, so that made so sense I, to me. I did that, and then um, you know, uh, lots of things happened. Lots of things didn't happen. Lots of things almost happened, and then this past January, one of our dreams happened. We had the first. We secured the first um, uh, congressional hearing on the promise. Uh, peril and power of the creative economy. It was the first congressional hearing in the history of the United States on artists and our arts workers and our economic contribution and art as labor, arts work, creative labor. Short version. And what we stand to lose when the creative economy is not restored and replenished and fostered and taken care of throughout the, the you know, the, the effects of the pandemic. One of the things that hits me right off the bat is this show is a big fan of early childhood education and childhood education and what we're doing about that. And I think there's, there's a huge challenge to your, to the arts in general, through a lack of funding through state states who elected not to fund that. Um, how, how do you address that? How do we address the, the yeah the that's a big that's a big issue right because the the kids um want to they role model and said oh i want to go get that job but if there there's no drama class because the school can't afford it mm -hmm. or there is an art class or what there isn't that there just isn't and and maybe in uh resource rich neighborhoods where the parents can band together and do after school things that happens but it's not systemic. I, I mean, I, I would like to talk about the, that problem that you're zeroing in on, Mark, and then solutions and what we can do about it. So the problem is, you know, our, our friends and allies, Michael Seaman and Richard Florida, uh, created this incredible yep. report uh, yep. from the Brookings Institution on lost art and uh, our economic value and then the, the losses, right? And 
in in this report, but also in in discussions with these gentlemen, we realize there we we stand we're looking at a lost a potential lost generation, right? So we think right. about the consequences of the pandemic, and when I talk about the lost generation, we're thinking about okay, so what happens then if these industries all start to implode? Because this is what's been happening over the last how many years? If these industries are are imploding and they're not getting what they need to survive and thrive, then we have a lost generation of young people who are then not entering the, the creative workforce and who also are not becoming a contributors to the creative economy in right. terms of you know right. being uh, ticket buyers, et cetera. Right. So the 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 scale of that loss is is huge because we're as I said earlier, a $919 billion economy. If you think about the next generation completely getting erased and not having an industry, any industry to join or be a part of or contribute to, those losses are astronomical. So that's the size of the problem. And then in terms of solutions, you know, something that we learned uh, in, in the work we were doing the last couple of years is that young people want to get involved. And even if they may not be of voting age, they can still, they still have a voice and lawmakers still do pay attention. We had a, uh, we had a, an effort, a campaign for young people called Arts Are My Superpower. And we had elementary school kids writing letters to their Congress people and saying, this is why I want the arts. And this is why I need the arts. This is why, what, what I want to do with my life. Um, so there, there's that people, the young people can be involved and it's as simple as, tweeting, texting, sure. writing letters, calling, because they do pay attention. And we're, we're living proof of that. They paid attention to our tweets. They paid attention to the letters, the letter campaigns that we drove. Um, the other thing is that Americans for the Arts has an incredible social impact wheel. And as you were saying, Mark, if you look at this social impact wheel, you start to understand the the value of, of arts and also arts and culture in our education systems and what happens when you remove that or you yeah. you don't fund it you know better SAT scores all across the board more young people who are graduating from school from college more people who are attending college lower crime rates uh, increased tolerance and empathy young people who have more diverse friend groups so I could go on and on and on and on about the social impact of having arts and culture in education but it's a it's a huge problem. And at the end of the day, you know, I think the answer is get young people to raise their voices and do something about it. Hey, Matt, do you think that this this um, attention that you're getting from Washington and probably through the media as well, because you, you're, you're all very connected in doing that, do you feel like we we are on the way back to making getting to a point of stasis or are we still going down? Is Are we still in danger of going down? Or do you feel like you kind of, we're, we're doing the right stuff now, we just need to do more? Um, there are more arts policies uh, introduced uh, in Congress than ever in history. Wow. Um, and I think that because of that, what gives me and what gives ever, should give everyone such hope is that when you have legislation that's introduced, it's much easier to call a representative and say, pass this. This yeah. thing that John Cornyn and Amy Klobuchar introduced, support that. We want your support. The good news is this. I don't think that we're going down. I think it's an, I think we have reached a moment where creative economy literacy is now becoming more um, oh, good articulated. And to your point about the students and the schools, which is really important and part of this, there's also an arts education for all act, which has been introduced. These art classes, orchestra, theater, they're, this is, I went to a conservatory, it was a trade school. And we are a big business because we're local business. And so part of what the issue has been for us is that the arts have a story problem in our government. So creative economy literacy educates people mm. to say, here's why invest, and I, I wouldn't even use the word funding, I would say investing. NEA is not an arts agency, the NEA is an economic agency that just so happens to specialize in creative enterprise. Right. And so if we can do that kind of reframing, you're gonna get red and blue districts who understand the importance of investing because the economic return is massive. So I think that we are, we are in a really great place right now. It's about evangelizing all the policies mm. that are out there and educating our legislators and educating each other. And this is part of that. So I think things are good. 
when you... If I can you... piggyback on that, Mark, sure. do you mind if I piggyback real quick? Because Matt just touched on something. To get folks to understand how important we are as a cre- as a, as an economic engine, because we always say when we would go and we, we called them our pitch meetings when we would meet with senators and house reps and their staff, we would say uh, there is no economic recovery in America without without uh, a recovery of the arts and culture sector because our fates are so intrinsically tied together. Uh, because if we go down, we not only tank these every state, every locale, every region because of what we bring to the table economically, we also bring down ancillary industries that are dependent on us in order to, for them to thrive. So you look at Broadway, you look at Chicago, you look at Hollywood. When these industries go down, we're affecting hospitality, we're, it's affecting retail, we're affecting transportation. So it's not just, oh, we implode and we leave whole black holes in the galaxy. That's already huge enough, but we're also sucking in all these other industries whose fates rely on us as well in order for them to thrive. So I just want people to understand that, you know, it isn't just about saving ourselves. It's also about how are we affecting our, our, our families in the restaurant industry, hotels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's huge. Well, so far, this conversation has gotten to where it's no longer hidden. I sure appreciate you, you both helping open our eyes to things. Thank you for that. Um, you know, part of our job as artists is to go to where the silence is and make the invisible visible. And so that we are able to tell this economic story is really, um, uh, uh, thank you for that opportunity. <laughs>